Six people is ready. Here we go. Number one, what study Bible do you recommend and why? I get asked this question a lot. Here we go. Not all Bible translations are equal nor good. Here, let me help you understand something. About, look, at me, look at my eyes because this is huge because if you don't have a good Bible, you will not understand Scripture. And if you don't understand Scripture, you won't understand God. That's how big this, this question is. Um, the original text was written mainly by Jewish men, disciples of Jesus, apostles of Jesus for the most part. And they wrote in Greek because it was, even though they were Jewish, it was the lingua franca of the Roman Empire. And so they wrote in Greek. So now we don't have the original autographs. The original autographs, the original uh, scrolls are gone, but we have copies of those. And we have literally tens of thousands of copies. So we know we accurately have what was written uh, originally. But we have to take Greek and translate it into English. So if you've ever, if you know Spanish, if you know French, if you know German or Russian or whatever, it's very difficult to take a, a language that speaks in, you know, if verbs and nouns are in different, pla- you know, different order of a sentence and try to translate it to a different language. So the difficulty is you can't just go word for word from one, one language into the next because the other language is like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So there's two versions of how to understand scripture from a translation standpoint. You try to make it as accurate as you can, even though it's going to read a little bit weird, or you try to make it as readable as you can, but then you're relying on the translator to tell the reader what God's word says rather than let God's word say what it says. So those are two different translation ideas. Some translate for accuracy to the original text, and others translate for understandability for the reader. The former, the first one, is closer to God's intent for the passage, but can be difficult to make sense of in the reader's language. The latter, the later version, is more readable but relies on the translator to tell the reader what God meant. While it's impossible to have a perfect word-for-word readable translation into another language like Hebrew or Aramaic, which is in your Old Testament and a little bit into the New, or Greek, which is your New Testament, into English, the goal of translation in this order is this, accuracy, you want to know what God said, clarity, is it clear what God is saying, and then readability, can I read it in my language? The best reality is where the reader has a Bible they can read in their own language and a gifted pastor to help them understand and apply the passage. So let me help you. We have the Bible in our language, which is a gift of God, literally. Think about how many uh, translations there are in the world in English. So there's no excuse for you not to read your Bible because you have God's word in in your own tongue. You have it in your own language. So you should be reading God's word all throughout the week. My role in your life is to help you read scripture, read a passage that I feel God telling me to to teach you and then you to understand it and apply it. So my role is a shepherding role in your life. I'm not the reader of the Bible for you. Look in my eyes. I'm not your Bible reader. You are your Bible reader. If you're like, I can't read, get the book on audio. I can't hear. Pray. Here we go. The best reality is where the reader, uh, the reader has a Bible in the language and the gifted pastor to help them understand and apply the passage. Good Bibles are this. Here we go. Here's how, to, here's how to buy a Bible. Here's the kind of Bible to buy if you're looking for one for somebody or whatever. In this order, in my view, ESV, which is what I teach out of, the English Standard Version, I think is the best accurate, accurate and readable. It's the best version of both of those. It doesn't stray far from the text and it's still readable in, in modern English. CSB, NASB, NRSV, NIV, and NLT, which is a New Living Translation. So I think in that order, that's the best versions of the Bible. Avoid paraphrases like the message, passion translation, just throw that right in the trash. Um, The Living Bible. So these are paraphrases. They're not, so Eugene uh, Peterson did the Message Bible that's very popular. Many of you probably may have a version of that. Uh, There's nothing wrong with reading that. That could be used for more devotional rather than Bible study, because it's Eugene's interpretation of all those passages. He's not really translating from Scripture. He's just like, that's why it's called a paraphrase and not a translation. So be very careful if you have a paraphrase because you're relying on another dude to tell you exactly what he thinks the passage says. Um, here's Here's our principle. A great study Bible is the ESV study Bible. So if you have to get a study Bible, I would get this one. Go on Amazon today, get the ESV study Bible. Uh, it's, it's, one, it's one of the versions I use when I make your notes every Sunday, every Sunday morning. It's, uh, it's got the text and it's got the description or, uh, to help you understand the Bible passages underneath it. Online study. If you're online, you're at Starbucks, you forgot your Bible, um, or you don't want to buy a Bible, you want to do everything online, cool. These are three great websites. 
Bible Gateway, go to Bible Gateway. Uh, Bible Hub, I use Bible Hub all the time. It's got the Greek, it's got the Hebrew, it's got commentaries, it's all free. And you can look up whatever passage you want, find a commentary on that passage, and so you can help, it'll help you understand it. If you like Greek, if you like Hebrew, if you want to break down the, the uh, biblical words in Greek, which is what I do on Sunday morning when I type, when I make these notes out for you, uh, it has all that on there. And it's all free. It's all online. You can study your own Bible online. Um, number two, <laughs> I get to ask this question all the time. Why do, you, why do you have a circle and underline in our Bibles? That's one of the most questions I get asked. I'm like, Really? Not, if God, can, if, if God can do anything, can he make a rock so big he can't pick it up? Not that question. Just why do you underline in the Bible? Okay, I'll answer it. Here we go. I usually have you circle verbs, some nouns, and underline commands. It's a study method to help the reader see the action and intent of the passage, which helps with understanding, retention, and application. We have been blessed with God's word in English, so make the most of it by studying it for all it's worth. So here's, here's why. So many of us grew up with the, with the Bible that was like, you don't touch the Bible. It's like, it's the Holy Bible. And many of us have like the Bible that we grew up with like that has a wood cover and it's on, you know, the, the table at home and it's, like, it's got like an angel coming down from heaven or whatever painted on the, on the front of it or whatever. And it's like, nobody touches the Bible. We never read it, but it's a beautiful little piece sitting on our, you know, on our end table or whatever. Okay, that's not what a Bible's for. A Bible is meant to be used and abused. If a Bible is, if a Bible is falling apart, that person's life probably isn't. Here we go. Ready? Number three. Going from that to this. What happens when, a, when people commit suicide? So here we go. I'm going to walk into deep waters. Some of us here are thinking about killing ourselves. Some of us have already attempted it. Some of us have had family members or people in our lives that have already committed suicide. So let me, let me walk into the, the darkness of some of our lives here, uh, biblically. Here we go. Everyone struggles in hard times wondering if life's worth living, including godly people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you with something. Look in my eyes. This is huge. Okay, look in my eyes. Because I want you to hear this from your pastor. Godly people consider dying. I put, all, I put the notes inside your Bible, okay? Everybody from, from Elijah, the most godly people, all the way to Paul in the New Testament, he's like, we despaired of even living. So there will be time, look at me. There will be times in your life where you go, I think it's better if I die. And you're going to wonder in those times, these thoughts shouldn't happen for godly people. Like, I shouldn't be thinking these thoughts if I'm really a Christian or if I'm really saved or if I'm really going to heaven. Like, I shouldn't be thinking these deep, dark, weird thoughts of, like, killing myself. Well, guess what? In Scripture, godly people, that goes through their mind. It goes through everybody's mind. So now let me walk you past that moment, okay? So I want to get rid of the stigma. You're, there are going to be days you're going to want to die. It happens to everybody. It will happen at least at once in your life. You're going to be depressed. You're going to go through hard times financially or relationally or just whatever. And it's going to be like, dude, I just, I just don't want to, I don't, I don't want to see another day. Let me help you beyond that. Here we go. However, suicide is premeditated self-murder. Murder in the Bible is in any form is a sin and a violation of God's will as it destroys the image of God in a person and incurs his judgment. So all throughout scripture, when there's murder, whether it's self-murder or some murder in general is a sin against God because you are, you are destroying the image of God in someone else. If you kill someone else, if you murder someone else, or if you murder yourself. But the Bible never speaks of how a person dies as determining where they go after death, including suicide. So here's part of the question. Here's part of the question I get. Um, uh, if, I, if, I, if I commit suicide, am I still going to heaven? Or I literally had uh, somebody come up to the table after second service and go, my mom just committed suicide last year. Um, thank you for answering this question. And she asked me a couple other questions about things that were bothering her about her mother committing suicide. And so uh, one of the questions is, if I commit suicide or somebody else commits suicide, do they go to heaven or do they immediately go to hell? Which in Catholic theology, for the most part, is that's a, that's a sin that once you commit that sin, you immediately go to hell, which is why many of us are ex-Catholics or we've we have that background, tend to uh, have this question. But here's the, here's the issue. Here's the principle. The event determining heaven or hell is belief in Jesus. So let me help you with this. I'm gonna, on the front end of suicide. Everybody, everybody listen to me. It isn't my last sin that determines where I go. Ready? Because I will never live perfect to the day I die, and 
on the day of my death, let's say I drop dead of a heart attack right now or I get in a car accident on the way home. The, the scripture says my heart is desperately wicked. And so I don't even know all the sin that even goes inside of my heart, even though I'm a saved person. So what that means is this, I'll never be perfect the whole rest of my life. Do I try? Do I try to not sin? Do I, do I rely on the Holy Spirit because I don't want to sin against God? Absolutely. I want to be like Christ. I want to be perfect. But I will never be like him. I realize that. And scripture even says that. If you think you, you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. So at the end of my life, it isn't my last sin, even if that last sin is suicide, that determines if I go to heaven or hell. It's my belief in Jesus. So Jesus forgives all of my sin right now and even sins into the future that I might do because Jesus has taken the punishment for my sin on the cross. I don't have to live a righteous life to get into heaven. Jesus has lived a righteous life for me. That's called grace. When we talk about grace, it means that I've been given, I didn't deserve the, the grace of God. Jesus gave it to me when I repented of my sin. I go, God, you're right, I'm wrong. Make me, make me like you. So that's the gospel. The good news is that you can be saved. And here's the point. Once you get saved, you don't have to live in paranoia every day of your life. Like if, if I die with sin in my life, am I going to hell? No, you're not, because Jesus has taken your sin. Okay, so, the, so the, the thing that decides whether you go to heaven or hell isn't how good you are in this life, it's how good Jesus is. So let me be clear about that, okay? However, here it is, as God forgives all our sin when we become a child of God and that we will never be perfect in this life, our last sin doesn't determine our salvation. However, the Bible never speaks of, nor has examples of, godly people committing suicide as an acceptable option to get out of hard, depressing, or difficult circumstances. God commands believers to endure mental, emotional, physical, or financial difficulty. And this even includes persecution, even if the persecution ends up in their eventual death. So even if you're being persecuted, and you might die, even the scripture still says, don't kill yourself, even if literally you're being led out to die being persecuted. It's like you stay alive all the way to the very end. Even in difficulty, you, you never take your own life. Believers never have authority to take their own life because our life belongs to God. This means God knows a believer may want to die but should choose to live for God as a reward waits for them for their faithfulness. This also means that if a believer commits the ultimate act of faithlessness in God, which is suicide, they may be saved, but they will lose everything they've worked for and face God's displeasure. Woo! This is something you've never heard, but it's actually in Scripture. So churches usually err on two sides of suicide. One is you commit suicide, you're going to hell, which isn't in the Bible, which I just talked about. And the other side is this. Uh, you know, you committed suicide, but hey, you're in heaven and everything's fine. The Bible actually doesn't say that either. The Bible says this, God expects you to live. God expects you to have hope for the future because God is with you. God expects you to endure, not give up. Our culture says give up. You depressed? Just give up. You, you want to just die? Oh, it's better if you're just dead. It's not just better if you're dead. It's better if you stay here and do something great for God with your life. Work through the darkness with God guiding you rather than stay in the darkness and die. So here's the thing, ready? Let me help you because some of us are in this, in this area. The Bible never says, you're going through hard times? Yep, then just kill yourself and go to be with Jesus, ever. It says endure hard times and that God will take you home when, when he decides. You never cut your life short because it's not your life to, you, your life doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. God gave you your life so live your life for the glory of God. God will do great things with you. You have a great future ahead of you. If you're alive here right now, that means that God has a plan for you. So you never give up. You never give up on God because God never gives up on you. Here we go. Ready? Though life is hard for all people, God promises to love and never leave us. Also, he gives us others to walk alongside of us and provide care and support in our pain. God walks with us in the darkness of our despair and shines a light into our hopelessness. There is help, hope, and healing in God and the support of God's people. Sometimes the greatest blessings wait on the other side of our greatest failures and depression. Hey, good times are coming. Good times are coming. Ready? Don't give up on God. God has a great future for you. Okay, endure, don't give up. And here's the thing, if you're going through that right now, God is good even when life isn't great. Hey, God is good even when life isn't great. You're gonna wake up days and go, my life sucks. That's in the Greek. 
There are going to be days you just go, I don't want to live anymore. Nope, on those days you go, God, I know there's still good for me waiting on the other side of my hard times. Get, get people to, that love you, that love Jesus, to walk alongside of you and speak health and light and life into your life. And get rid of your loser friends. That'll help. Ready? Here we go. Here we go. Hey, if you struggle in this area, in your notes, I have, I have a, a 1-800 helpline. It's a Christian one. Uh, also, if you, if you struggle in this area, and we, it's open during uh, office hours during the week, call our office. We will pray with you. We'll walk alongside of you. <clears throat> if you have had somebody that's died in your life of suicide, and you're going through just mourning and hurting, I have two great books in your notes here, Aftershock by David Cox and Grieving a Suicide by Al Sue. Um, these are two great books that you need to read. It's a biblical uh, way of just walking you through the death of somebody you've loved. Ready? Here we go. Should Christians get tattoos? A little bit lighter. Yes. Here we go. God prohibited Israelites. All the, all the, uh, okay, here we go. God prohibited Israelites from marking their body for the dead or copying Canaanite rituals. So this verse, uh, Leviticus 19.28, which is actually in the law, um, gets brought up all the time. Don't mark your bodies for the dead and get, don't tattoo your body. It gets brought up all the time with this particular issue. Number one, that was, that was a Canaanite ritual where they marked themselves for the dead, which, which God didn't want the Israelites copying. And number two, that's in the Old Testament law. And we, don't, we literally don't follow any of the law anymore. Uh, we follow the law of Christ. And so in eternity, God writes his name on us and references having our names carved into his hands, illustrating a permanent relationship. While most people would not consider getting marker ink on their skin as a sin, tattoos are just a longer-term version of marker ink. So think about this. And, hey, where are my clubbers? Anybody went clubbing last night? <laughs> you, go, you go to the club and they go, let's stamp you. And you pay $48 to drink a flat beer and be in a place that you shouldn't be. You realize the Holy Spirit's going, you just paid $48, now you can go home. Okay, that, that moment. Even legalistic people, I've never heard a legal, legalistic person go, oh, the minute you get a stamp on your hand or you go to see your daughter's play and she's like the fairy godmother or whatever in school and they, you pay your $3 to get into the school play and they mark your hand, you know, they stamp your hand with like the high school thing or whatever to know that you paid. I've never heard even a legalistic person go, oh my gosh, this thing's gonna be, un- it's a sin because I've marked my hand for the next seven days or whatever, right? So tattoos are just a longer term version of ink that's on the top of your skin, it just goes to deeper layers. So the ink isn't the problem. It might be your your intent of why you're getting tattoos. That that is the sin. And here it is. As with most things, intent matters. And as your body belongs to God first, you should never get something that dishonors him. Tattoos are a conscience issue and should not be done against the will of parents while dependents are at home under their authority. So sometimes I'll hear this. You know, you'll, you'll have your 14, you have your own home and you do your own thing. Then you still honor God, but you gotta make that call later in life. Um, will Christians go through the tribulation? Uh, here's another thing that you won't hear in most churches around our area. Yes, we will go through the tribulation. The scripture is very clear. Christians will be there at the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. The Bible is clear that believers or saints will be alive on earth when Jesus returns at his second coming at the end of the tribulation. Jesus will arrive with dead believers from heaven who will get their resurrected bodies when he returns. Believers who are alive on earth at that time will then be raptured to be with Jesus in the air. And as they meet Jesus in the air, they will then get their resurrected bodies. So all believers will get the resurrected bodies when Jesus returns. This is known as the first resurrection. All believers will then arrive with Jesus to the earth and rule with him for a thousand years, which is called the millennium. Everybody look in my eyes, because some of you, some of you like legalistic people are going to fight me in your mind. What about? Listen. Ready? There's no such thing as a secret rapture. You've read the Left Behind series. You saw those weird movies from the 70s about like an airplane, an airplane flying. All of a sudden, the pilot's gone. Oh my gosh, what's happening? Literally, none of that's in the Bible. The rap... Oh, I'm talking to the right people then. Good. Ready? The rapture is mentioned exactly one time in the Bible. And you know where the rapture is mentioned? At the second return of Christ. It's a physical event that Jesus returns and snatches believers off the earth. Whenever he returns, the ones who are living are going to go be with him in the air. All of us, we're all going to be dead that's in this room. But we're going to return with Christ, get our glorified bodies. We will rule with Christ for a thousand years. There's no secret rapture. People aren't going to magically disappear. Uh, It's nowhere in scripture that's all made up. Next, do our believers, do, uh, do our relatives see us from heaven? 
One of the most difficult things in life is seeing a loved one die. We've had multiple uh, funerals here in the, at the orchard the last few, uh, in the last month. We have, still have some coming up too. During this traumatic time, it can be comforting or sentimental to think that they're watching from above or heaven. The Bible is not clear about how much access, if any, dead people have in affairs on earth. However, there are no examples of the spirits of the dead having knowledge of what humans do. The one clear example of a man who was actually pulled back from the grave is the prophet Samuel, who had no idea why he was allowed to be brought back to talk to King Saul. So if you read it in uh, 1 Samuel 28, Saul is freaking out because he's losing the kingdom. And uh, he, he goes to a medium uh, to pull back a soul from the dead. And the medium is surprised because it actually happens, which the majority of the time, uh, it's, just, it's, uh, just, it's one, it's demonic uh, to go to a necromancer or whatever. But Saul does this, and God allows Samuel to come back from the grave to talk to Saul. And you know what Samuel says when he comes back from the grave? Why'd you bring me back? <laughs> he had no idea what was going on. So even the one example we have of like the dead coming back to earth literally have no uh, idea what's happening on the earth. So let me help you with this uh, in a loving way. Your relatives do not look over you. They're not guardian angels. Uh, nobody, a, humans do not become angels. Angels are their own, angels are on earth and they are their own creation of God. We never become angels. We are always human for eternity. We don't become something else in eternity. Angels are created by God to help us. They are on the earth, but people don't become angels or guard us or listen to us or talk to us. If you're talking to somebody in your mind or somebody's talking to you, that's demonic. Wasn't that light and fluffy? Here we go. Um, the book of Hebrews encourages Christians to endure as they are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Sometimes you'll hear this like, oh, but Hebrews, Hebrews 12 talks about being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and the dead saints are kind of watching over us. It's actually not what that uh, passage is about. Because in the same way that the spiritual race of a believer's life is metaphorical in that passage, so is the dead believer's observation of that race. The writer of Hebrews is simply saying, if they can finish the race, so can you. Humans that have died don't become guardian angels or demons and do not watch over us from heaven or have any power to help us. Look at, look at my eyes. Um, anybody that's gone on ahead of you doesn't oversee your life. They don't have any power to help you. Don't pray to them. Um, but I have good news, ready? Here's the principle. The good news is we do have a loved one watching over us from heaven, Jesus. So if you're gonna pray to somebody, pray to the one who can help you. Pray to God, pray to Jesus. D dead saints won't help you. Grandma won't help you, okay? They're in eternity. You're here on earth. So the only one that you should be connecting with is God who loves you, that's Jesus. We do have somebody looking over us from heaven that loves us, and it's our savior. Um, why don't you do altar calls every week or sinner's prayer? Man, I get this a lot. You want to know why? You want to know why? Because Christians sense the spirit of God here. When you walk in like, you wouldn't believe how after some sermons are like, dude, that, I felt the Holy Spirit like just convicting people. Like, why aren't you, why don't you do sinner's prayer? Like, why don't you do altar call like every week? I'm going to help you. Despite some churches doing altar calls or reciting a sinner's prayer every week, neither of them are in the Bible, but are culturally created. So look in my eyes, everybody that's ever told that to me. That's not in the Bible. There's, no, there's not one altar call in the Bible. There's not even a sinner's prayer in the Bible. You don't want to know why that is? Because it doesn't matter. What matters is that Jesus is exalted and sin is confronted. And then when people feel conviction of sin, they come to Christ. Okay? So there isn't a magic prayer to pray. And there's not a special time during a service where you need to have that. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. I've done it. We just did it a couple weeks ago. People got saved. It was amazing. But here's the thing. People get saved here all the time. I lead people to the Lord on their first Sunday at our welcome booth. Like, here's a cup. And they go, I need Jesus. <laughs> like, okay, let's pray to receive Christ. Then. We lead people to the Lord in our uh, pastoral interviews all the time. People get saved here all the time. It just doesn't need to be during a special time. Although we do it sometimes. But I just want to be very clear. It's not in the Bible. Even though church, some churches do it as part of their program. Um, it's not anywhere in scripture. Neither Jesus, Paul, nor any of the apostles gave an altar call every time they preached, but only at certain times when the Holy Spirit prompted them. People can be saved at any moment where Jesus is exalted and sin is confronted. We don't make it part of our program here at the orchard, but allow the Holy Spirit to lead our pastor. However, we do have pastors and prayer tent open every week to help people find and follow Jesus. So look at my eyes. Every stinking week, we have people 
at pastors and people out in the prayer tent, if you want to get saved, if you're like, I need Jesus or I need prayer for something, like I just, I thought about killing myself this week. I, w- I wish I had somebody to pray with. Boom, we got a tent for you. We got people that love you. Don't leave here without getting prayed for and loved on. So that's, that's always available literally every week. Um, the orchard is a special miraculous work of God where people's lives and eternities are changing all the time. And then here's an even better one. Should Christians drink? The answer to that is yes, please do drink. (laughs) Or you will die if you don't drink. If you mean alcohol, perhaps not. Here we go. (laughs) Biblically, the issue isn't the consumption of alcohol, but rather inebriation or addiction to alcohol. All throughout the Old Testament, alcohol or wine was part of celebrations or festivals commanded by God. And as there was no refrigeration, literally in all of history up until we had electricity, grape juice would turn to wine quickly. Jesus and all the apostles drank wine. It was real wine. It had real alcohol in it. I was taught my whole life, I don't know, it was boxed with water and blah, 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 but it still had alcohol at some level, even if it put water in it, but that's actually not in scripture. Nobody ever put water in alcohol. They, they, drank, they drank wine, real wine with real alcohol in it. Jesus did, the apostles did, but here's the difference. They never got drunk, so it affected their behavior, and they didn't drink, so it was a, it was a part of their life in, a, in, a, in an addictive way. And some of us struggle with alcohol. We're like, man, I just, I have to drink every day. Or I have one beer and it turns into 20 or whatever. Okay, so you have to look at your own life and go, if this is an addictive part of my life, it's sin. Anything that rules your life outside of God is sin. I'm just picking on alcohol because this happens to be the question, but it could be anything. It could be pharmaceutical drugs, it could be pornography, it could be whatever. Anything that's a cyclical part of, of your life that rules your life, you're like, I do it. With the minute it, I feel that in my body, I just, I'm gonna go do it. That means you're not being ruled by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, a, it's an addictive part of your life that you need to say no to and get help with. Also, um, Jesus and all the apostles drank wine but never got drunk or lost control of their choices or allowed anything to rule or run their lives except the Holy Spirit. Also, just because some believers can, they shouldn't drink alcohol when they are with those who they know struggle with it. They should refrain during that time for the sake of loving their brother or sister. So let me help you. Let me be super practical. Uh, If you don't struggle with alcohol, you're like, I don't know, I could have a glass of wine or not. If I drank, if I didn't drink the whole rest of my life, I wouldn't care at all. Or I could have one glass of wine for a month or during a wedding or whatever. It's like, it doesn't affect me, whatever. That might be you. But if you're with your husband or your wife or somebody that you know struggles with alcohol or you're out to dinner with them and you are thinking about ordering a glass of wine, but you know they struggle, then it's time to get a seven up. Because you, you look out for people that struggle in that area. And if you struggle in that area, you just, you, you look at it like this. I can never drink again the rest of my life because I know it will train wreck my life. However, they, other people can. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. Okay, cool. You can. I can't. It's okay. I struggle in this area, so blah, 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 whatever. If, you're, if you happen to be a person that doesn't struggle, okay. But if you're with that person, show them some grace. And even though you're free to do it, don't do it for their sake. Ready? Here's our principle. The only spirit that should control you is the Holy Spirit. Cheesy, but true. All right, what questions do we have? Real quick. I only got time for a couple. What does God say about cremation? Um, I get asked this question a lot. Look in my eyes. It doesn't matter how you die. Some people, get, some people die in a house fire. Some people die, get eaten by an animal. Um, it doesn't matter what happens to your body. Look at, me, look at me. Your soul that can't die exists inside your body that can. When, you, when your physical body dies, your soul goes to be with God. It doesn't matter what happens to your body, whether it's cremated, whether it's buried, whether it dies in a house fire, if you drowned or whatever, your body's eaten by animals. It doesn't matter what happens to your body. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, he resurrects your body literally out of the dust. So it doesn't matter what happens to it. What do you got next? In IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization, when an egg is frozen, is it a child of God? Does it go against God's will to use artificial methods to conceive? Woo! Wow, here we go. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have time to dig into all this. I'm going to say a couple things. Uh, helping, helping fertilization happen is not against God. So if you have sperm and egg that have to be artificially uh, uh, inseminated or whatever, it's still the process of sexuality. You're just getting a little uh, medical help, uh, which isn't a problem, which isn't an issue. It's not a sin issue. It's not a moral issue, okay? Um, Here's the, so this goes along with uh, uh, contraception. So let me help you, all of us that are uh, n- trying not to conceive, okay? Um, it's not against God to keep the sperm from entering a woman's body. So if you use contraception in that way, that's okay as well because you're in control of 
of how you use your body, all right? Women, if you are on contraception, um, and basically there's hormones in your body that are faking your body out that you're already pregnant, and it just allows the egg to pass on through without being impregnated, be very careful that whatever drugs you're using to help your body not get pregnant, that you're not, that you're not aborting a conceived fetus, okay? So what you don't want to happen is uh, pregnancy happens, and then I just get rid of whatever I didn't want. That's an abortion, not contraception. Contraception is saying on the front end, I don't allow the sperm and egg to get together. I keep them separate, whether it's the egg passing all the way through or the sperm not being able to get there. I don't even know why I'm doing this. That was weird. <laughs> I talk with my hands. Sorry if that was really weird for you. Uh, but I want you to understand, ready? Uh, contraception is, is a conscience issue on you. Just make sure that, especially for women, obviously they deal with the pregnancy side of it, that your body, you're not just getting rid of a child that's already, and that would go for uh, fertilized eggs as well. Okay, because we would consider those uh, children, chilly children. Okay, one last one. What we got? Me, Pastor, share their opinion or provide guidance on political issues. Why do you not feel led to do the same? I get asked this all the time. You're a really influential pastor. Why don't you use your platform to do X, Y, Z about politics? Because Jesus doesn't care, okay? Jesus, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. I already know some of you. America, people are going to email me. Stop, stop it. Do I care about politics? Absolutely. Do I hope that some of you become politicians, godly politicians, and go help lead our country and our nation? Because heaven knows our state can use some of it, okay? I'm not saying I don't love politics. I do love politics because it runs our lives. And I hope you are a godly politician if God raises you up to do that. However, from here, the church is not a political machine. The church is about Jesus and the gospel alone. My idea is to make you a follower of Jesus and then you'll become a better politician. You'll know how to vote because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so my, <laughs> listen to me, my, my goal is to make you more like Jesus, not more like my political view. Every week, <clears throat> 